Hi, and welcome to part six in my series about linear viscoelasticity. And then today I'm going to talk about how you can think about linear viscoelasticity as part of a rheological model with springs and dash pods. And uh, we started this series with uh, the Boltzmann superposition principle. I talked about how we can derive this equation on the left. It's an integral that describes how you can calculate the stress. And today I'm going to show you that this is actually equivalent to a spring and dash pod model. And uh, it's shown, shown a figure here to the right of this rheological representation. And there are multiple reasons why it's kind of nice to be able to think about linear viscoelasticity as springs and dash pods too. Uh, one reason is that it allows you to better have an intuition about how these models behave. It's easier to visualize springs and dash pods in our heads than these equations with integrals, I think. And the other reason is that it also allows us to generalize the theory to be nonlinear, and I will talk about that towards the end of this um, video. So let's talk about uh, the Maxwell model first. So this is my way of introducing the similarity between the rheological model and the integral equation formulations from the previous slide. So in the Maxwell model, we have a linear spring and a linear dash pot. And the linear spring is a spring where the stress is proportional to the strain. And a linear dash pot is a dash pot where the flow rate, the strain rate, is proportional to the stress. And these are the governing equations for that. And once you have established this, you can formulate an equilibrium equation, force equilibrium. You can write it in different forms. The one I will focus on today is the one uh, here at the bottom, where I use stress as the variable that I want to search for. So it's stress rate and stress, and then, then the given strain rate that's input. So this is how you can formulate this for a Maxwell model. Now, let's apply this to a case where the maximal is undergoing a jump in strain. So for times larger than zero, we get this jump in strain, and that's what it is. I can then use the equilibrium equations and very quickly solve for them and get the stress as a function of time. And what I do get when you do that is the equation here in the middle. So it's an exponentially decaying stress. And what we do then is we normalize the stress by the, the jump in strain, and we get a modulus. So this is the relaxation modulus for a Maxwell element of this kind. And here is what it is. And what's really cool about this is that this is, in fact, the equation that we have also for a linear viscoelastic prony series that we talked about from the integral formulation before. So what we have proven is in fact that a Maxwell spring dashboard like this behaves exactly like a one prony series term linear viscoelastic model. They're equivalent mathematically in terms of what stress and strain they predict. Also, in real life, we, we don't just have one prony series uh, term, we usually have many prony series terms. And that would then be equivalent to multiple spring and dashboard uh, Maxwell elements in parallel. So a, a realistic prony series model would have many of these in parallel, and they would give exactly the same answer. So that's how one can convert in your head so the mental picture of linear viscoelasticity into this uh, rheological representation. Now, if you want to use this in real life, it's always useful to be able to calculate the stress. And the stress is given for uh, a, a rheological model is as a differential equation. We have the rate of stress and the stress itself. And if you solve that using a forward Euler approach, which is the simplest possible, you get this equation here. And you can also solve it in using a backwards Euler solution, an implicit Euler, and that's the equation down here. And they're different, obviously, but they are very similar results in some cases. So let's compare that. Here is a a spring dashboard single prony series term with the parameters that are listed in the Julia code to write. The modulus is one, the, the viscosity is one, and I pull on it and then unload it. And we can see that the different curves here is all the same except the number of time increments that I took in the calculation. If I don't have enough time increments that the time increments become very large, a forward Euler solution can become unstable. And that's well known. We, we have seen this in other examples in the past. A backward Euler solution is more stable, as we know. And here are just the numbers, if you want to look at them for a different number of time incrementations. The code that I coded up to calculate this is to the right, illustrating that this works and it's a stable approach for calculating the stress. And again, this is very different than the stress that we calculated from the integral equation. Uh, 
The procedure is very different, but the results in the end are actually the same. So there's just two different ways to solve the same problem. And let's go back to the idea that I mentioned earlier about nonlinear viscoelasticity. I really think that using a rheological framework is a very good approach to understand how we can generalize this to nonlinear viscoelasticity. And one example of how to do that is say, well, instead of a linear dashboard that we just introduced earlier, what if we have a nonlinear dashboard? So the, the strain rate is uh, not proportional to the stress, but maybe stress raised to a power. And this is very common, commonly used for polymers, and it works really well. And it's a simplified version of the bergstrom boys model that I developed some time ago. So yes, using this simple generalization of the linear viscoelastic model in terms of the flow equation can give you very interesting and powerful results. So to summarize, linear viscoelasticity I initially derived as an integral equation from Boltzmann superposition idea, but you can also do it in terms of springs and dashboards. And both of them are equally valid, and both of them are useful to understand. And secondly, nonlinear viscoelasticity is easy to sort of extend from the rheological model. So that's another useful feature of this kind of approach. If you have any questions on this, you can ask them below.